excited to introduce you to our amazing panelists today. So first we have Tracy Shirachi Chip. Tracy is the CEO of The Mark USA Inc. and is responsible for making key business decisions to increase The Mark's abilities to address client needs. Uh, Tracy and her team of evaluators work with organizations to deliver high quality data-driven information to define and measure impact. And Tracy has over 20 years of consulting work, um, working with companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers and Deloitte. Next, we have Gregory Nielsen. Uh, Greg is a sought after speaker and consultant committed to helping leaders and organizations translate vision into reality. Uh, he's an accomplished nonprofit CEO, having previously led the Center for Nonprofit Excellence. And his leadership has been recognized locally and nationally, and he has been honored with awards from the Better Business Bureau for Ethics and the Louisville Urban League for Championing Diversity. And finally, we have fundraiser, consultant, teacher, and mentor Rowena Valen. Rowena has been working within the nonprofit industry since 2003. Uh, she has held positions at a number of different organizations and is currently the founder and lead instructor at the new School of Fundraising. So Tracy, Greg, and Rowena, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, before we get into kind of some of the questions, uh, would you please maybe share just a little bit more about your work and what you're most looking forward to from today's session? Uh, Tracy, why don't I hand it over to you first? Super excited to join everyone. So thank you, Meredith. Um, we're really passionate about helping organizations that are focused on helping people. So that's, I think, the best way of putting it and just excited to share our knowledge and help in any way that we can. So I look forward to hearing what individuals have to ask and be able to share anything that you guys need assistance with. So with that, I'll pass it on to our other panelists. Great. Um, Greg, did you want to go next? Sure. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, uh, Greg Nielsen. And I served as a nonprofit CEO for a little over a decade uh, before becoming a consultant. So I'm most looking forward to the questions from um, all of the attendees. I know um, and understand the challenges that you have and looking forward to addressing what's on your mind. Awesome. And then Rowena. Well, thank you everyone for having us and for signing it, joining us today. Um, I I may feel like fundraising is the answer to everything. So um, I look forward to speaking about that today. And also I find I get as much from all of you um, that then we share with you. So do engage in the chat because we're eager to see like what is your, what's happening in your world. And that drives what I choose to do at the school to support you too. So thanks for having us. Okay, amazing. Well, thank you all so much and um, welcome again. So. Let's get into it because I know everyone is looking forward to hearing from all of you. So uh, I'm going to direct this first question to, to everybody to, to kick us off here. So uh, the past couple of years have been a whirlwind for everyone. Nonprofits have had to pivot in many different ways and adopt new strategies, techniques, and technologies. Uh, what do you believe is the most important lesson that the pandemic has taught us as a sector? Um, Greg, do you maybe want to go first? Sure. I, I think there's two things. I think as someone who um, does a lot of strategic planning, I think it's taught us the importance of leaving room for flexibility and agility in our strategic plans, that our plans can be a guidepost for us, but we have to be able to respond um, when things change unexpectedly and leave room for that in our plans. And then the second big takeaway I had is the importance of connections within and across the nonprofit community. You know, what we've all been through over the last three plus years is, has tested us in incredible ways. And so the ability to have colleagues, professionals um, that you can call on that don't make that journey so lonely, that can help you address some of those challenges together, I think is incredibly important. Great, yeah, and um, Tracy, how about you? I think um, to add to what Greg says, I think um, having processes and systems in place that can adapt to change are really critical. Um, what I also call or refer to as collaborations and partnerships. You don't necessarily have to know everything and do everything, but you need to know the right people. So to add to what um, Greg was saying, I think is really important. And the third is really evaluate what you're doing and validate whether or not it's working or not. I think that's super critical in terms of resource allocation and making sure that you're confident in the decisions that you're making and that you're adapting um, according to the changes that you foresee for the future. So it's really looking ahead and planning ahead. Mm -hmm, for sure. 
And then uh, Rowena. Oh, I don't know how I follow up those two. I agree with them. I would add just that I believe it's really kind of taught it or demonstrated how resilient we all are um, as an industry and how we can weather a storm. And, you know, if for anybody who was fundraising, you know, in the mid 2000s in Canada, when we had a recession then, like we, we remember, we remember those times in the trenches and we come out the other side of it better um, as organizations. Uh, and and we can you know we've we've lasted this long we continue on and we're doing it yeah amazing um let's talk a little bit more specifically maybe about the impact of our current economic situation so you know recently we've heard talks of a recession prices of goods and services have increased We've seen inflation mount financial pressures on many individuals in our communities, um, and specifically in low-income households, uh, which means that there's an increasing demand for the services of nonprofits. So Rowena, uh, from your work with fundraisers, what are you hearing about the current economic situation and, and how it's impacting nonprofits? Well, I just got a, off a Zoom call about an hour ago with a senior leadership team who said, you know, it's a really serious concern. It's a concern for morale. Um, it's hard sometimes for fundraisers to hear the statistics here in Canada, you know, Canada helps um, is forecasting a 12% decrease in giving overall in our country. And so that's pretty serious. And so uh, we also hear a lot of people I mentored a young fundraiser who went from a team of eight to a team of four in the middle of a pandemic. So, you know, it, it's real. We have serious staff shortages and you know, I think at times like this, it's really important to kind of strip that back and find our our values alignment with our organizations and um, and remind ourselves kind of why we're there and what motivates us and and what's motivating our donors. And like Greg and Tracy said at the beginning, it's it's really kind of causing us to step back and rethink about what we're how we're doing things and what we're doing and maybe be more strategic in our approach, um, a little bit more ruthless in some of the decisions we have to make, but. Yeah, for sure. And then Greg, you know, I know you work with a lot of board members and in leadership teams. How are nonprofit leaders in your circles reacting to the current economic situation? I think the advice that I keep sharing is there's so much that is outside of our control right now. You mentioned several of them between inflation and, and employment shortages. Control the controllable. That's what I've been telling my nonprofit executives. Control what you can control. And the same goes for boards, right? This is not the time um, as a board member to go to one of the extremes. And unfortunately, anytime a crisis hits, a lot of times what we see with boards is that they go to one end of the spectrum. Either they become so incredibly involved and mired in the day-to-day -day weeds of the organization because they're panicked, or they completely disengage on the other end of the spectrum. So part of control the controllable is as a board member, understand your role understand what your senior leadership team needs from you in that moment. And it may be steady leadership. It may be support. It may be wisdom. And Rowena, uh, to put a plug in for your work, it may be donation of funds as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you. You know, it's always important to understand where we're at before we can look at where we need to grow or where we can kind of go from there. So with that, you know, what kind of shift in mindset needs to happen for nonprofit teams to be better prepared for the impending recession? Um, Tracy, I don't know if you wanted to cover that one first. Well, I think one thing that Romina said that really stands out is first, we have to acknowledge that what we're going through right now is hard and it's difficult. And I think acknowledging the human aspect of what we're dealing with first, right? As leaders and as employees and as a whole team, right? It's hard what we're all navigating. And I think it's being able to admit that versus plowing ahead and saying that you're superhuman and you've got it all under control, right? So I wanna take a pause, I think, and really say like mindset is first acknowledging that. And then I think the second step is really realizing that we have the confidence to tackle what we need to control or manage or lead in and that we have the needed information or data at our fingertips. It's just that we have to find it and we need the support to do that. And once we're able to do that, now we can evaluate and validate our decision making and reinforce that. And a lot of it, I really think is really a mindset around um, confidence building and really filling your toolkit with the right equipment and the tools that you need to basically go to war is what I also like to say. 
So, um, you know, war in a hopefully a positive way, not a negative way, but I'm just saying like, it's a really like hard time um, for a lot of nonprofits and you're at the front line of serving people that really have a high need for your services. So it's equipping yourselves to be able to um, lead from that perspective. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, Rowena, I know you've been in the nonprofits, you've been on their nonprofit fundraising team. Um, I guess I have the same, the same question for you. How can, how can they prepare themselves? I think that we as an industry know what needs often, often there are tiny little nonprofits who maybe are still trying to figure out, but we kind of know what needs to be done. And I think now then, you know, more than ever now, things like to borrow, you know, a culture of philanthropy, you know, to really truly have a culture of philanthropy at organizations so that you get everybody on the same page. I always think we tend to reserve fundraising training and teaching for just fundraisers, but if we are looking at a time where we're anticipating it's a harder time to raise money, it's more important now to get everyone as to make everyone fundraisers and they don't have to be out there raising money, but to appreciate what the fundraisers need to do and to kind of be that auxiliary team member, whether you're a programs team member or a board member or a marketing and communications team member, or you process donations, it doesn't matter. Like I think that I always say it's, it's really important to get everyone involved in this because your small teams of fundraisers can't do it all on their own. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Um, we tend to be reactive in moments of uncertainty, um, but every good leader knows that being proactive is essential to preparing for and, and overcoming challenges. So Tracy, as someone who has helped several nonprofits to evaluate their organizational needs so that they can make better decisions, uh, what steps do you think nonprofits need to take right now to deal with an impending economic crisis? I think one step is really understanding what you know and what you don't know and being honest about that. Like, what information do I have um, at my fingertips within an organization and what information do I need to seek or what is it that I don't know? I think getting clear on that is really helpful in terms of thinking about um, how you move forward. And then once you're able to understand that, now you have to step back and think through like, okay, what resources do I have available to me to really um, efficiently deploy those resources where they're needed most to maximize utility, right? And so um, I think, you know, it's separating it into little buckets rather than trying to um, look at everything all at once, which can be really overwhelming. So it's really just stepping back and being able to segment out your decision making and really understanding what you're lacking in and what you do know, and sometimes being able to focus on that information that is reinforcing um, certain decisions and what's missing is the gap that you need to close. So that would be my best um, advice in terms of breaking down data and breaking down something that could otherwise be over overwhelming and hard to dissect. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. And then, I mean, to kind of flip that, Rowena, donors have to make smart financial decisions right now too, right? They have to decide if they can afford to keep contributing to nonprofits on the same scale that they have been. And so what can fundraisers do to sustain or improve their donor retention rates in the coming months? I always started off by saying there's no special sauce. Um, you know, there's no there's no special way, and every organization's so different. But I think that we can all do more on usually sharing our story, storytelling, um, and through storytelling, demonstrating impact. Um, and I think that those are sometimes things that we are just so busy and off to the next one. Oh, there's an event coming up and there's this coming up, but we really need to, everyone needs to kind of pause and take a moment and, and spend that time because it's invaluable time to really demonstrate impact. And Tracy um, does, you know, helps with the, the numbers of that impact and, and evaluation. And, and that's fantastic. And if you can't quite get there as well, it's just important to share stories to demonstrate impact and think of like all the different ways that you could share that to help your own resources. So social media and your, you know, annual report or on your website or, you know, however you could do that, but to use that one story and go far to demonstrate that. Yeah, so I'm hearing a lot of kind of everybody plays a role, right? So, so Greg, what role do you think nonprofit board members should be playing to kind of help alleviate some of the pressures on, on their teams right now? 
So we always talk about board members trying to stay at that strategic level. And I think that that's where they can operate most effectively, particularly in times of crisis. Um, and I think the role that they can play is, as Tracy mentioned, first of all, assess and understand what does the landscape look like? What does the landscape look like for us locally at a really hyper local level? And then the second important role that they can play is reimagine what it could look like. I'm having tons of conversations with boards that are healthy, that are productive about reimagining collaboration in their community. So a lot of times we want to jump to the far end of the spectrum there and talk about mergers of nonprofits. And those can be valuable, but I think it's a real um, reimagining of a spectrum of collaboration of how can we better understand who else is working in our community on the issues that we care about? How can we partner more effectively because resources are scarce uh, and we can perhaps achieve more together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've we've talked a bit about the importance of, you know, everybody playing a role and being proactive in times like these. And part of that, you know, comes from being able to act quickly. Uh, nonprofit teams need to be able to make data-driven decisions, and some of that includes gathering and reviewing insights about their donors and communities. So, uh, Rowena, how important is it for nonprofits to know their donors so that they can make better decisions? So important. And I do think we are, many are just also not sure how to do that, like how to go about doing that. Um, kind of the the, the simplest training that we do or kind of the first step, we we say like, why do you call two of your donors? Call somebody who's been around for 10 years, uh, $10 a month and call somebody who signed up yesterday, you know, gave the first donation and talk to them um, and get to know them and just kind of start those conversations. But it's so important for us to know our donors. I think many organizations are actually so small or kind of at the beginning of the stage that um, they're still trying to kind of cast their net out to see what that could look like. So there's a lot of aspects to that question. And I know my fellow panelists uh, will chime in on that as well. But um, we really have to make, that's part of making the smart decisions of knowing who you're speaking to. And then we know how to tailor something, um, whatever it may be. And our chance of getting a better success rate is higher. For sure. Yeah. And then Tracy, what can nonprofits do to learn and understand their donors? Like, do they need to create logic models or survey their community or perform a da data analysis? What steps do they need to take? How can they get started? So I think the first thing is really understanding, like, what do your donors want to accomplish? What outcomes do they want to see? Um, one thing that we're always talking about is there's a distinction between outcomes and output, right? And really getting clear on that. So I know we have like a free workshop on our uh, website where individuals can educate themselves around what's the difference between outcomes versus output. And once you get really clear on that, I think you need to next understand what do you need to know and what is it that you don't know, right? So before you go on this path of implementing what we otherwise refer to as like a data framework, which involves, you know, logic models, surveys, things like that, you have to step back and first think about what do you have, what do you not have, and what do you need to know? So now that you understand what your outcomes are that the donors are looking for and the changes they want to see in the community, then you can identify what internal data or information do I already have? right, that can support that or help to describe that, and then what information do I need, and then start on this path of building the infrastructure or the system or the processes around the data framework, which includes the logic model, the surveys, and all of that fancy stuff is what I'll call it, right, but it's just really simplifying it first and really understanding what change am I trying to see in my community, and what change is it that the donors and those that I interact with want to see happen to people, right? And then that's really identifying the short-term, medium-term, and long-term outcomes first, and then focusing on the systems and processes that will help you to adapt to those changes that are constantly on an ongoing basis in the community and our social environment. Mm -hmm. And Greg, how can, I mean, we're coming back to you again to talk about board and, and leadership, but how can, you know, a nonprofit board and those executive C-suite team members really assess their connection to the community? I think, first of all, it's who's around the table. 
I think the most important thing that a board can do right now with respect to connection to the community is understand who's on the board team right now, what skills, talents, perspectives do they bring to the board team, where might there be some gaps, blind spots for the board, how can they go about strategically filling those gaps. So it's not just about going out and blindly recruiting board members to achieve an arbitrary number right now, it's about understanding who's around the table, what gifts do they bring to the board team, where might our blind spots be, and how can we be really intentional I use that word all the time, intentional, about going out and filling those gaps. There's a saying that I, I share with my clients, and it's the, the people around the table determine the questions that are asked. And so if you have missing voices or a missing connection to the community in your boardroom, there are critical questions that are not being asked. There are critical observations about what you could, should, or must do that are just not being raised at that moment. So it's an opportunity right now to assess where are we as a team, where do we need to go? Mm -hmm. And on you know the the topic of of nonprofit leadership, I have a a question for all of you. So how can nonprofit leaders and executives be both responsive to the economic situation? while also being responsible to their stakeholders, community, and their, their teams right now. Um, Rowena, did you want to take this one first? I'd love to. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's a bit of, I would say it's a bit of a mix of what kind of we're, we're all saying here is I think that, um, again, I was just on, on Zoom this morning with a provincial organization here in Canada. And, you know, they're looking at how to keep their teams motivated in the, you know, troubling economic times in the middle of pandemic. We are also all coming out of a lot of isolation. And so we are craving that connection. Um, they want to support them. They want to remind them. It's like all of what we've been talking about, um, remind them of you know, how, what is the positive, right? Like how you kind of take us back to our roots. Like, why are we here? And, and why do we do what we do? And people still, you know, yes, there's a decline in giving, but there's still a lot of people giving. So, you know, we still have to get out and do our jobs and, and not feel deflated. So I think it's about keeping people inspired, um, you know, driven, giving them the tools that they need to be able to do their job, uh, and not making, you know, I, I'm a big advocate for professional development. Obviously, I run a school, but, you know, this is the time to kind of double down and make sure our staff and our teams know how to do their job and have the tools and feel, feel very supported in our organizations um, to stay because we're also, what do they call it? The great oh, what is it, resignation as well. So, you know, there, it's important that we keep team members. Um, and so how do we make them feel valued, um, in their roles? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, Greg, I mean, same, same question. How can they balance being responsive and responsible? I'm going to, uh, I agree with everything Rowena said, and I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction. Um, and say, I think that it's an important opportunity to also acknowledge that you can't do it all. I think the temptation for nonprofit executives, nonprofit leaders throughout the organization really is to build up the position as superman or superwoman. And I have to be able to rise to the occasion and do it all and balance being proactive and reactive in the needs of my staff and the needs of my board. I think this is also an opportunity for leaders to step back be vulnerable, ask for help when it's needed, and identify where can that help come from. Are there um, aspects of leadership that I can share more effectively with my staff team? Are there aspects of leadership that my board can be more engaged with or my volunteers? I, I always am hesitant to turn it into a, a more isolating position. And so I think it's an opportunity right now for leaders to, to rethink the work and rethink how they share some of that leadership mantle with others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, Tracy, as a consultant, how, do, how would you kind of advise a nonprofit leader that's trying to balance those two things? So first, I kind of see stakeholders, your community and your teams as one, right? So understand that as an, in an organization, you're all interconnected, your board, your management team, 
those that you serve, your volunteers, you're all connected together, right? And so based on that, you guys all have shared common goals. So it's really an organizational alignment and effectiveness around how are you all paddling the boat in the same direction and how are you using those oars because each person has different tools, but it's really aligning around that. So when I say like a data framework, there's actually a lot of power in that in terms of connectedness and connecting people, even though people tend to think of numbers as not having feelings or, you know, are not necessarily a um, emotional thing, but it's really like empowering individuals to make better decisions and being able to connect parties and different functions within an organization together too. So I think that's really powerful when you think about it because it's utilizing a framework of shared information so that all parties that are working towards the same thing, which is improving community, improving lives, are all able to access that common ground of what is it that we all need to work on? Where are our gaps? Where do we need resources deployed? And that way you're all strategically focusing on things versus moving in different directions and trying to address different things just purely because um, the people or the function itself is different. So that's one conversation that we have a lot with um, nonprofits is kind of a little bit of what Rowena shared and what Gregory shared as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I want to maybe go back to, to Rowena for, for a second, because you mentioned professional development um, and the importance of, you know, equipping our leaders to be able to handle these kind of things. So are there other ways in which we can invest in our nonprofit leaders and maybe our emerging nonprofit leaders so that they are, you know, ready to deal with things when they might not be expected, like a global pandemic? <laughs> right. Um, I'm going to pick up on what Greg said to you of, you know, we have leaders that have come up in nonprofit that have never had any leadership training or support or pro D in that. I remember, I remember being kind of an intermediate emerging leader and a vice president I was working for said like, wow, you just got to fake it till you make it. And so that's kind of what I learned. Um, and I guess I did well doing that, but it's not really like leadership training. Um, and so I think that our leaders have learned on the job how to be leaders, but they've never been supported in that. I worked um, for a few years at an organization that works with women and girls on their leadership. And I looked at like the courses they were offered and most of them were, for, well, they were all for profit, they were taking them, but like amazing, amazing courses. One was called Women Leading the Way. And like a, women would come out of that and say like that just like that changed my life like that work that that time together and the network and the women I was around that changed my life and so not many nonprofits have thirty two hundred dollars to to send somebody to that so I just really think how do we build that for the nonprofit industry which is what my school is working on here in Canada. How do we how do we support leaders and emerging leaders? I remember getting my first team when I was a director and it was like a gift. There's your team, go. And I was like, but I've never been a director. I don't know how to do that, but nobody helped me with that. So I think I would love to see donors kind of loosening those chains that we have on nonprofits that they can spend on that, or maybe having those questions and saying, you know, I'd love to give you $5,000 for leadership capacity building. Ooh, can you imagine, right? Like if we build up the leadership and the emerging leaders at these organizations, the impact of that is going to be just phenomenal. Like you, you basically couldn't measure it, but you're, you're helping these or these um, very dedicated people that work in these nonprofits. So I think that there's definitely room to do that um, and pursue that. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, I have before we get into because we've seen some audience questions coming in, which is amazing. So uh, before we get into those, I have one more question for for all of you, and maybe Greg will start with you. So what are you currently doing to help nonprofits navigate the current economic challenges? And how can you support maybe some of the nonprofit professionals that are listening to this panel session right now? 
So the the bulk of my work is in three different buckets. Um, you know, the first bucket is board excellence, and it's about helping boards understand their role, helping them understand how to perform effectively and be that support partner for the executive director that we've talked about in the in the panel discussion today. The second is strategy and rethinking for organizations and being a thought partner with them of how can they reframe their strategy in a dynamic rapidly changing landscape. So strategic planning is a second bucket. A third bucket is around coaching and organizational development. So again, having worn uh, that hat of executive director, understanding the stresses and the challenges that go along with that being a, a coach for nonprofit leaders. And then my passion project uh, for anyone who's on the on the webinar today is I host a podcast called Nonprofit Vision. So if any of you are podcast listeners, I invite you to check it out. I try to welcome a different guest on for each episode, about two episodes a month. Uh, so there's about 116 episodes completely free on your favorite podcast platform. Amazing. And uh, Tracy. So one of the biggest things that we're helping organizations with is really focusing on capacity building, right? Individuals are short resources and really constrained by that. And I think also frustrated. So how can we help provide nonprofits of different sizes with the capacity building and really focusing on systems and processes and really the data framework so that as people come and go and as things change, you still have the foundation of that framework from which to operate which really gives you the agility and adaptability to different circumstances because you're, you're helping to ensure that all the processes and systems are um, institutionalized within the organization. So as you add people or people leave, you're able to still move forward and still accomplish what you need to do in terms of the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. So it's a really um, exciting time in the sense that we're able to help um, nonprofits of different sizes with, you know, one of the key, I think, frustration and stress areas of day-to-day -day, um, management and leadership. Mm -hmm. And then Rowena. Well, we, you know, I, I do think that we're all looking to raise more money. Um, if you're a big, huge national organization, you're still looking to raise more money like the, the hamster that never gets off the wheel. Um, so, you know, I think when I look at what I would consider the pain points are that we're hoping to address with the school, um, a lot of organizations uh, or small organizations that come to the school are looking at how to diversify their revenue. So they're in a grant stream and they can't seem to get out of it. Um, and also I would say that we spend quite a lot of time often talking about how to get others fundraising for you. So we're all short resources as well. So how to get not only your whole organization as fundraisers, like we said, but how to develop revenue streams that are going to benefit you and not like, just make you work like day and night. So how, how to have an, and not only, you know, obviously there's no, here's your 10 step process, but how to think, like how to make those decisions and how to, uh, you know, look at the return on investment of different revenue streams and, and then how to make, how to take the step to do it. Cause I think that's often people could take a workshop or a course, but then they go back and they just do their job. And they're like, I don't know how to do that where I am. So we try to make it attainable. Amazing. Okay. Well, well, thank you all. We've seen some, some great questions come in, in the chat. So, um, I'm maybe just going to throw these out there and you guys can, can grab whatever, um, is resonating with you. But the first one is from Jill and Jill is asking, how would you go about adjusting targets to be more realistic amid the impending recession? Are there tricks to keep in mind that apply pretty generally? I can go if, if people, if that's okay. Um, I, uh, I had, I was doing a workshop recently and somebody said like, I, you know, I set these targets and, and I'm very, you know, I come with an accounting background and then they, it's, we never, we don't know if we're going to reach them, which is true. Just not even on a recession based, we have to be flexible like that. I think that for my, this is just me personally, when I've been on teams, I want people to succeed. And I want people to be able to reach it. So if it's a tough year, I mean, I was setting targets in 20, 2008, 2009 in the middle of a recession, and we went kind of as low as we could. We went what we would say conservatively, conservatively with those targets. 
um, in ways that was the least amount of risk. Uh, and then great if we met them. And it's one of those things that if a fundraiser is given a $10,000 target, they're not going to stop when they reach that, right? So the importance of them being able to be successful and then push for the 15 versus set it at 15 and they reach 12, right? So that's just how I look at target setting um, and, and just kind of the importance of, of being successful. I was going to add to that. I think there's, um, we have to be clear about what kind of targets we're referring to, right? Whether or not we're referring to financial targets because we're trying to focus on financial sustainability of the organization, or whether or not we're talking about targets in terms of what's expected from donors or funders and what they're looking to be achieved. So I think, you know, when you're looking at both, it's like what results have been generated as a result of either the work that's been done or the resources that have been deployed? And have we maximized utility from both? And can we demonstrate that, right? And once you're able to demonstrate it, but also measure it over time, now you're able to understand what do you relax and what do you turn up more of? But until you start somewhere to really, I think, distinguish what type of targets we're talking about can and for whom it's for and what the end result is, then we can start figuring out how do you relax some and turn on others, if that's helpful. So I don't think you can look at it all equally the same. It's just understanding that there's different parameters and different things to measure depending on what you're trying to look at, whether or not it's financial sustainability or whether or not you're trying to look at social impact and the changes that are occurring in the community or for people, right? So it's, I think that's really important to clarify and distinguish. I'll just add, just building on what Rowena and Tracy said, um, sometimes it's not only about lowering the target. Sometimes it's about shortening the time frame of your focus. And particularly in a time of crisis or in a time where things seem kind of upside down, it can be really hard to predict a year out, 18 months, 24 months out. There's nothing wrong with shortening that lens of your focus and saying, you know what, let's focus right now on our targets for the next three months. What are our targets for the next six months? Because that's a little bit more knowable, a little bit more within our control right now. So sometimes it's about adjusting what is the what is the benchmark. Other times it's about, you know, what is the what's the distance of our horizon? Mm -hmm. um, okay, great. Uh, next question is, and I think maybe Greg will start with you for this one. And then Tracy and Rowena, if you have anything you want to chime in on, absolutely. Um, but so it's a question from Andrea. How would you suggest re-engaging a board that has stepped back and lost motivation for your projects? Great question, Andrea. And it's it's like I said earlier that particularly in times of crisis, it's it's one of those things that boards tend to go to one of the extremes. And if your board has gone to that extreme of disengagement, meaning they've ghosted you, they've disappeared, they're not in the they're not in the, in the work with you. That's an opportunity to remove ambiguity. I think your best friend in that point in time is clarity. And I think board members need to know three things. They need to know specifically, what do you expect of them? What do you need from them in this moment, short term, right? So it's not be a good board member, be more engaged. It's I need A, B, and C from you. So that's part one. The second is what support do they need from the organization to meet those expectations? Rowena can speak to this certainly from a fundraising standpoint, is that they may need some training or they may need some additional support. So expectations, support, and then the third piece is accountability. Where is the accountability going to come from? If you're trying to rescue a board from disengagement and pull them back into a level of healthy engagement, there has to be a culture of accountability that's enforced somewhere, ideally from the board leadership or governance committee, but it has to come from somewhere because ultimately the board, that's their team. Yeah, I'll pick up on, on what Greg said. I completely agree. I've when I was consulting, I had a fundraising consultancy for quite a few years and I would have organizations say, well, our board is just not being effective. And they're just not, and I said, oh, okay, what have you, what have you asked them to do? And they're like, well, they should just know because they are, they're leaders in their community. And that was common. And I'd say, well, to your point, Greg, like you need to be clear, like, what are you asking them to do? 
and you know what are the parameters around that and to your point as well and i would say well have you given them training on fundraising well why would they need training on fundraising um and so in fact boards probably more than anybody do they need that time because often they'll be really kind of grappling with a lot of inner things like i I feel maybe it's like it's wrong for me to connect with my network as a board member because maybe there's a power imbalance or can I reach out to vendors at my company or like so sometimes it's actually they need someone to talk that through with and they're definitely not going to do it with staff there because they're supposed to be the board members right like I think we've all been there and so I think there's a lot of ways that you could give them the tools but yes be very clear of what's needed. Rowena, I love what you just said, because it, it reminds me, sometimes it's not just the message. The message that you're delivering to your board can be spot on and perfect. Sometimes it's the messenger. And if you are the executive director and you've been the one who has been um, trying to lead the rally cry all this time, they may be tuning it out, right? So sometimes it's the message, sometimes it's the messenger. And ultimately, as I said, it's their team. So sometimes bringing in someone from the outside who can help facilitate a conversation with the board members themselves about what do they expect of each other? What support do they need? And how do they envision holding each other accountable for that can be particularly helpful. So I'm gonna add something else, which is I think it's asking why are the individuals disconnected? because if we assume that let's say we've done all of this, right? We've educated them how to fundraise. We've like, you know, done all these things and we're still finding that individuals are disengaged. I think it's being able to also step back and say like, people are really overwhelmed right now. And so some of that disengagement could it simply just be simply that they're, you know, busy running family, busy running work, whatever it may be. And so the disengagement has nothing to do with the organization, but maybe it does, right? Or maybe it has to do with like lost passion for the mission or, hey, you know what I thought I had time for, um, I really don't right now. And I think to both what Greg and Rowena you're saying about like being clear on what you need from your board member by saying directly to them, I need ABC from you. The board members are also able to say, hey, right now I can't do ABC because of X, Y, Z going on, right? And I think it's really being able to dissect that because you have to ask why, like, why are they disengaged? And there's multitude of reasons. And sometimes asking those direct questions and being able to communicate what your direct needs are, you'll get a response and an engagement because someone will just simply say, I can't do this right now because of this is what's going on, but I can help you later with this. And it may not be the answer one wants to hear, right? But at the same time, it's like, now you know why somebody's disengaged and you can eliminate all the other things in your head that are telling you what you thought all the reasons for the disengagement were. You now can eliminate that because you now know why they're disengaged. And I think it's really simplifying things for leadership that's really critical right now because everyone's just thinking about things in different directions. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I know that's a different way of looking at it, but it's acknowledging that individuals that are volunteering for organizations also have competition for their time too. So how do you help them manage it so they can help you manage what you need to? Can I pick up on one thing? Because Tracy, I think that's so eloquently said and i think that there's if you think of someone like that there's a great deal of guilt that comes with that as well because they've signed up for something and usually they're kind of trying to process that um so having that conversation and, and allowing them to be like that you might find something else that they're able to help with that's within their capacity and within their realm that makes them feel engaged again and it's not the ABC that the entire board was offered, um, but because they want to do something. So I think that's so important. Um, it just might be, like you said, a time of their life or something else going on. Amazing. Okay, I think we have time for one, maybe two more. So we got um, two questions come in of a, a similar kind of nature. So first was from um, Catherine and Catherine's asking, have you found that acknowledging current economic realities in donor communications is helpful or will that messaging negatively impact donations? Um, which is kind of a similar uh, question that we got from Teresa and Teresa is just asking around 
if we should be sharing if donations are down and by how much and if that's an effective way to communicate with donors. Maybe Rowena, did you want to take that one first? Sure. I will start with saying I'm not in house right now and I'm definitely not a marketing strategist. Um, so, you know, whatever I say will be just kind of what I've been personally been hearing. I know that organizations that have been, you know, we have a workshop called the power of your story and it came up of would people talk about the pandemic or should they? And the, just the participants, our workshops are small. So the participants got together and said that they feel like people are a little bit tired of hearing about it. It's a reality, but, but they have been taking it out of their narratives and so I hate to say it but I feel like that question is kind of like it it, it depends right I think organizations need to think about uh, you know they know their donors best and it might actually work well for organization a and not for organization b so it's hard to say across the board of like yeah that's a good strategy or that's not a good strategy um, but yeah, sometimes it creates a sense of urgency. Uh, sometimes it can shut people off. It's one of those things that I just feel like it kind of probably depends on the very specific things going on at your organization. If you guys want to pick that up and have any more insight. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's something that you guys both said earlier is getting really clear on what you need and why. And so I say that because rather than, you know, communicating to your donors, like it's tough, it's hard, it's challenging, I need more money, blah, 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 right? Instead, the communication can be, hey, I have plans for A, B, C. I thought about this strategically for these reasons. I think it can benefit, you know, these parties this way. But what I need to do that is I need these type of resources and these are the resources that I need. Could you please help me with these particular resources? Because these resources are going to be used for this over here or that over there. And this is the outcome that's going to be impacted or changed because of those resources. And I think that is a probably better conversation to maybe what you were trying to highlight, Rowena, because you're basically communicating the need for certain things, but you're communicating in a different way that's more palatable for the donor. And if anything, I've found working with different funders and donors, they're more responsive to that very specific clear ask and what the result is going to be as a, as a result of giving this money or these tools or these resources. And they can get behind that because they know that there's a um, return on that investment, so to speak, or that there's going to be a change that's going to occur. And that's what everyone wants to see right now is positive change and working together to do that. So I think it's a more positive spin on the reality of what we all know, which is globally, there is a recession going on and we're all severely being impacted by it. But how can we work together and connect about how we do that so we can improve um, people's lives? I think just to, just to build on that, I, people give to people, people follow people. And so I'm a big proponent of authenticity in our communications. So for your organization, if you can't tell the story of where you are right now as an organization and where you're heading in the short term without referencing kind of what the economic condition is around you or in the organization, then share it. If it's not central to your story or not centrally affecting you, then I would leave it out and not make it um, uh, its own factor or its own uh, aspect of the story if it's not central. Amazing. Okay. We had a, a couple questions that we won't have time to get to today, but um, we will, Toby and I will work with you to um, help get those questions answered by our, our amazing panelists. So um, that is all the questions we have time for, but before we close out the session, um, we would love to hear any final thoughts from all of you as we kind of send everyone off into their the rest of their day. So um, maybe Tracy, did you wanna go first? So I like to say like simplify and really know, you know, what information you need, what information are you seeking and how does that contribute to what you're trying to achieve when it comes to outcomes and happy to, you know, talk further. There's a number of resources that we know of that are free, right? Everyone likes free and support each other in terms of capacity. So happy to talk more about that, but it's really, I think, strategy and clarity and just um, being able to 
get a hold on what one can really manage during this time and choosing what that's going to be because there's a whole lot to be done right now. Yes, for sure. Uh, Greg. I would start with gratitude. So I, I, I'm extremely grateful um, to be part of this panel, learning from Tracy, learning from Rowena, um, and also thankful that so many nonprofit leaders who are extraordinarily busy and overwhelmed right now would take time out of their schedule to participate in an event like that. So definitely humbled and grateful to participate in that. And the one parting word I would share with them is um, you're part of a, an extremely large profession and a profession of people that care about each other and are willing to help each other. It can feel lonely leading a nonprofit. It can feel lonely being a staff member of a nonprofit, but you're not alone. There are resources out there. Tracy mentioned them. There are people out there that are willing to connect with you, willing to help you out. Um, connect with, with others. Connect on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, podcasts, whatever that uh, medium that works best for you. Amazing. And then finally, Rowena. Go out there and start throwing things at the wall. And when I was a younger fundraiser, somebody said to me, you know, basically fundraising is about just throwing a whole bunch of stuff at the wall and then seeing what sticks. But if you don't throw it at the wall, nothing's sticking. And I thought, well, that's incredibly disappointing to hear that that's how sophisticated our industry is. Um, but that's actually what we see in a lot of our workshops. So don't don't shy away from it. Try some new things. Try things that are not going to be incredibly risky or resource heavy and just do it. So my message is like the Nike, just do it. Start throwing things at the wall and eventually something's going to stick. Amazing. Um, that was great advice. I hope, you know, I'm seeing some things coming in the chat that everybody has found everything super helpful and, and useful today. So thank you so much to Tracy and, and Greg and Rowena. Um, and thank you everybody for being a part of this. 